Hello, welcome. Thank you all so much for coming. This is something that the Ellison Scholarship Committee of actually a couple years ago has been looking forward to for quite a while. Um, there was a thing called COVID and the pandemic and we couldn't quite gather in person and travel across the country and bring um, the wonderful Dr. Heschel here. Um, but ever since, uh, I'm also gonna give a plug to Education for Ministry. Ever since when I was in Education for Ministry, we read a book called Sabbath. Um, written by her wonderful father. And um, there was this intro that was written by Susanna. And it was all about growing up in a household where Sabbath was revered and Sabbath was kept um, and what that meant for the family life, what that meant for um, just the way that, that you interacted with each other. And so we were, at least in, in our group, we were very touched by not just the book, but the intro. And we thought, wouldn't it be really cool if um, with the educational fund, which part of the bylaws, which I did read, actually, um, the bylaws do say that we can, with the money, spend it on education for the church as a whole, not just to educate the, our youth that are going to college and for our seminarians. And so as one of the pillars, we decided that we would bring um, Dr. Heschel here to our church to educate us about um, the things that she is passionate about and the things that, that she knows of. And of course, today's topic is Sabbath. Um, and so it's a very special moment that El Ellison actually gets to step in front of the church and host a speaker. So anyway, that being said, I just I do want to thank um, all of my colleagues that, are, that serve on Ellison um, and that agreed to bring her into um, Christ Church and to bless even just the greater community here. Um, so with that, I just wanted to welcome, she is the Eli M. Black Distinguished Professor at Dartmouth um, University. She's the Distinguished Professor of Jewish Studies, and um, I think you're really going to love what she has to share. And of course, I will say, um, we will have time for some questions at the end, so don't be shy. I know we're in kind of a lecture situation, but um, that's part of it. Anyway, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me and for all of your efforts to arrange everything for me. It's really been a wonderful day to be with you, and I'm sorry that I live so far away uh, because I would love to come back and continue the conversations that we've started in the last day. I I'm also very moved that you invited me to come to talk about the Sabbath. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at my watch because I know we, um, we're not gonna be staying until 11 p.m. I, I am aware of that. <laughs> Some have to leave by 10, but okay. So, <laughs> um, but you know, uh, when I was growing up, my father always uh, would remind us to put things in historical context. And that's very moving to me that you, as a, as a church, would invite me as a Jew to talk about the Sabbath. The Sabbath, which is not just part of Judaism, but which I think is a treasure that has been given by God to all of us. So um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the different traditions, Jewish traditions involving the Sabbath, how the Sabbath is understood. I'll tell you a little bit about my family and growing up and what the Sabbath means to us. But I, um, I want to just say that I, I do see the Sabbath as something that um, we need. Uh, I'll just tell you that I was in Poland in October because the Catholic University of Lublin, which is in eastern Poland, opened a center for Christian Jewish relations that they named for my father and they asked me to come for the opening. And while I was there for a week, I also visited some of the small towns nearby where Jews had lived. Sometimes Jews were 60% of the population. Uh, they lived in the, in the center of the town and some of their homes are still standing. But I went to the cemeteries and they were all wiped out, all destroyed. And it was, it was startling for me and upsetting, of course. Uh, I, at the end of the week, it was Friday, and I realized in this small town of Lublin in eastern Poland, there was no Sabbath anywhere. Nobody was keeping the Sabbath anywhere for miles around. And I felt suddenly very, sad about that and upset. And I suddenly felt, you know, the Sabbath is not just something for Jews to observe. The Sabbath is something that civilization needs. We need the Sabbath. 
So let me say, uh, first of all, for Jews, of course, and for religious Jews, for, for me, for growing up, the Sabbath was, in a way, the axis around which our lives revolved. That is, for example, when I was growing up, if we would, uh, my mother would take me to buy a new dress, but I would save the dress to wear for the first time on the Sabbath and say a prayer when I wore it for the first time. There was true also of special food. If we went to the market and all of a sudden there were peaches in the spring, we didn't take it home and eat. We saved it to eat on the Sabbath because there was a special taste about the Sabbath, a special atmosphere, and it's the atmosphere that really is so important. You know, um, I just have to say that recently I've had uh, some exposure to what people have been saying in the sort of the chattering around the United States about Sabbath time. I've seen that there's some political scientists who say, yes, it's good for the workers to have a day off. I've read about people saying, it's like going to a spa. It's good for your wellness to observe a Sabbath. And I have to say I'm very sad about that because without understanding the religious dimension of the Sabbath, they're missing something. It's not just about turning off your phone or your computer or not working that day. It's first of all about receiving. So the first thing about the Sabbath that's important is anticipation. The anticipation that the Sabbath is coming shapes the week. I start thinking already on Wednesday, what am I going to cook? What am I going to prepare? Even earlier, I think, which guests should I invite from my community? How will we celebrate the Sabbath this week? Because it's a celebration. And the Sabbath isn't something I make. The Sabbath comes to me. So in the New York Times a few weeks ago, there was an article about someone who said she liked having a Sabbath dinner so much that even when she was busy on Friday, so she had it on Wednesday. <laughs> You're missing something with that. The Sabbath comes to us on Friday with sunset. On Friday, it's a busy day. Friday, I don't get much work done. As a child, I went with my mother to the stores, to the grocery store, to the, to the party cake it was called, the bakery where we would buy a challah. Once a week we might have a dessert, for example, not during the week, but something on Friday, special. In my home, there's always at least two courses on Friday, not just the one meal during the week. But there's an anticipation, and the cooking on Friday, hurrying to cook because the Sabbath is coming and you want to be prepared because the Sabbath comes like an important guest, like a special member of the family, or it's described in Jewish literature as a bride. It's like a wedding, or as a queen coming to your home. So you bathe and put on special clothes and set the table with beautiful dishes. And then, then you see that the sun is about to set. We would be busy in my home growing up in the kitchen with last minute, is everything finished? Is it already cooked? Because you don't cook on the Sabbath. You prepare in advance. And then it was time. The cooking was over and we went into the dining room and kindled the Sabbath lights and said the prayers, and my father would bless me. And then we would go in the living room where we had a window overlooking the Hudson River that is facing west, and we watched as the sun set, just the family there. Sometimes people go on Friday evening to the synagogue. It's actually something new, new meaning the 16th century, there was a new, <laughs> well, I've been thinking all the way back to Abraham, you know. <laughs> but um, it became a custom in the small town of Safed, which is in the Galilee, a small group of Jews who wanted to live an intensely religious life. And so on Fridays, they would wear white clothes and they would go out as the sun was setting to greet the sunset and welcome the Sabbath into their, into their lives. 
and they started a service called Kabbalat Shabbat, receiving the Sabbath with hymns and songs and special prayers of joy to welcome the Sabbath that was coming. The Sabbath comes to us in the Bible, as we know, in Genesis with the creation. It's also associated with the exodus from slavery in Egypt. In Exodus, in the middle of the discussion of building the tabernacle in the wilderness, there's suddenly a verse in chapter 31, verse 13. It says, Sabbath is my covenant, God tells us. Know that I sanctify you. The verse says, my Sabbaths, God says. God's Sabbaths, a gift from God. God's Sabbath. Yes, it's a day of rest, like creation. God rested, we rest. But the Sabbath is also presented at the conclusion of creation. After six days of creation comes the Sabbath as the soul of the other six days. Humans have a soul, the sixth day, they have a soul, and that's the Sabbath. We're told to rest and to rejoice, and I want to say something about those, both of those. In the Talmud, in the uh, compilation of Jewish religious observance, that was composed over 500 years, a course of 500 years, the Talmud associates the Sabbath with the building of the tabernacle and says, well, there are 39 categories of work associated with building the tabernacle, and those are the categories that you have to not do on the Sabbath. You don't build, you don't use money, you don't light a fire. A later commentary says, not only do you not light a physical fire, you also shouldn't light the fire of controversy. Certain topics, when I was growing up, were not discussed on the Sabbath. My father was very intensely involved in the civil rights movement and the movement against the war in Vietnam. We didn't talk about those things, politics, at the Sabbath table. The Sabbath table was for religious discussion, talking about the Bible, the Torah, it was also a time for jokes, for humor, for laughter. Sometimes I think I heard the same joke a dozen times, but laughed each time. Guests would come and they would share some humor, stories about their youth. But what does it mean that we rest? My father says the Sabbath is a day of surpassing civilization. Not to deny, not to reject in any way, but to have one day when things of space, when work, when building civilization is put aside, a day for the soul. We build, he said, a sanctuary in time. What is time? Time is life. Life is composed of time. What do we do with our time? What's interesting is that the word for rest, menucha in Hebrew in the Bible, menucha is also taken as a synonym for joy and also for paradise. And above me here in this beautiful set of stained glass windows, we see Psalm 23. And one verse of Psalm 23 he leads me beside the still waters. Beside the still waters. The still menucha, the menuchot, the waters of menuchot. This is an important word in Hebrew, the waters of menuchot. God leads us. Where do we find menuchot? Where do we find that stillness? We find it, of course, in the Sabbath. Menuchot is also taken as a synonym for paradise. Why paradise? Because we're told in the commentaries that God gave us a taste of the world to come, of paradise. And the children of Israel asked God, where? Where is that taste? And God said, 
It's in the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the taste of paradise. I think one of the problems we have today, and I say this after reading that New York Times article and so many others, is that we don't talk about paradise. We don't talk about what we imagine paradise to be. If we don't have a sense of what paradise means to us, how can we understand the Sabbath? How can we create the Sabbath as a day that's a foretaste of that paradise? Where is our sense of paradise? We get so busy with so many other things. What is paradise to us? We rejoice, and paradise is also about rejoicing. There is joy on the Sabbath, and the Sabbath in antiquity was also called a sign of resurrection. I think, and I'm not a Christian theologian, but I think in many ways Jesus means Sabbath. There is a connection between Jesus and Sabbath, a sign of the resurrection of the world to come. I'll just mention that my father wrote this book, published it just shortly after World War II. His mother, three of his sisters, extended family, and dear friends were murdered. He was in the United States. He came as a refugee at the last minute. How do you recover from that? The only thing that could help him recover was his faith, prayer, and the Sabbath. He wrote the book in beautiful English, and he had just learned English. And it's like a miracle how the words, the poetic language poured out of him. People used to say that maybe his wife had really written the book because she was born in America. They thought that was very funny. It's a book that doesn't chastise Jews for not being more observant of the Sabbath, even though the book came out at a time when my father was very upset that conservative Judaism said it was okay to drive to the synagogue on the Sabbath. It's very different when you don't drive. For one thing, you have smaller synagogues because everybody lives within walking distance, and everybody goes to each other's homes after the service. You walk over. Once you start driving to the synagogue, well, maybe the car is running out of gas and I'll stop at the gas station, even though you shouldn't use money on the Sabbath. Or maybe I'll stop at a restaurant. Or maybe I'll go to the mall. Walking on the Sabbath is very important. To walk, my family and I walk right half a block to our synagogue. But my father said this doesn't mean it's a rejection of modernity or the secular world. It's not a rejection. It's not a withdrawal. And my father was not one of the ultra-Orthodox Jews who completely isolate themselves from the rest of the world. But rather, my father emphasized, how do we experience the Sabbath? How do we create the Sabbath in our home? You know, there were rationalist philosophers in the Middle Ages who said, well, the Sabbath is a good day for you to strengthen your faith. Strengthen your faith. But there were other traditions that thought of it differently. In the medieval Jewish spiritual traditions, the Sabbath was a way to give strength to God. Now we might ask, what does that mean to give strength to God? Doesn't God have all strength? But actually, my father said, to give strength to God means to create more of God's presence in this world. That gives strength to God. How can we each create more of God's presence in this world? The Sabbath, according to some mystics, is the name of God. We enter the realm of God on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a divine presence that comes into our homes once a week. 
The Sabbath is a day to soothe away sadness. The Sabbath is a day to feel as though we're standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, about to receive the divine revelation. Just as we prepared for the revelation, so we prepare for the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, Jews gain an extra soul. That's an old tradition. What soul do we receive? The soul of Moses. The soul of Moses comes into our lives. You know, there's a verse in the Psalms, in Psalm 109, that says, V'ani tefillah, and I am prayer. I am prayer. I think that's beautiful. Can I make my life a prayer? How do I live my life so that my life itself, what I do all day, is itself a prayer? My father was in Selma for that march with Dr. King in 1965, and he came back and he said, I felt my legs were praying. I am a prayer. The Sabbath is, of course, holy, and we're told that the Sabbath comes to us from God to sanctify us, but we're also told that we sanctify the day. It's very striking. How does a human being create holiness? And yet we're told in the Bible over and over, you should be a holy people. We're not made a holy people, but how we behave, how we act, how we speak, how we pray. The Talmud says, that holiness is something we create together with God. The Bible, Prophet Hosea says, the Holy One is within you. And the Talmud says, for that very reason that God is within you, treat your body with care. The Sabbath is not about rejecting the body, but elevating it and pleasuring it, having good food, laughing, being with friends, joy. Sanctify yourself. A wedding is a sanctification. My father said that the commandments in Judaism become an architecture of time. We don't have cathedrals in Judaism but we have a Sabbath time. Can it be made into something that would be a sanctuary, a cathedral, a palace? The Sabbath also has different moods, different atmospheres during the day. Friday morning, you begin getting ready, getting ready, and in a sense, the the buildup becomes more intense during the day a little anxious, did I, did I remember to cook this and did I cook that, did I prepare everything, do I have everything? And then, and then it's over, and then you light the candles. And then comes peace, peace in the home. And then you gather, then you pray. And the atmosphere is sweet, it's warm, it's happy, it's joyous. In the morning, Saturday morning, Shabbat morning, you go to the synagogue. Hopefully, you're in a you're in a synagogue that's elevating, that's moving, that's warm. You come home and have lunch, and at the table, it's a little different from Friday night. It's a lighter meal maybe some conversation about the rabbi's sermon. And then, after lunch, when I was growing up, my parents would take a nap, and I had to be quiet. Very difficult time. (laughs) I found, for some reason, I never take a nap during the week, but on Shabbat afternoon, I find myself taking a nap. 
It's as if somehow the parents, you know, our parents live on in us. And then in the afternoon, I often go back to the synagogue for the very short afternoon service and then the rabbi might give a talk and then there's a very short evening service and the concluding prayer, again with a candle, with sweet spices that one smells because your extra soul of the Sabbath is now departing. It's sad, it's a little sad. There is a sense on the Sabbath of anticipation, of course, but also of anticipating that maybe this Sabbath, maybe this week, the Messiah will come, we will be redeemed, there will be no more war, no more violence, we will have peace maybe this week, that hope, that anticipation, that wish. And then as the Sabbath departs, you realize, well, perhaps next week. The Sabbath is not a time in the liturgy to confess sin. We don't do that. We don't remember the sins, we don't repent, we don't pray for relief for anything we need. There are no petitions in the liturgy. Rather, it's a day for praise, for psalms, for thanking God for what we have. There's no fasting, no mourning, no grief, expressions of grief on the Sabbath. All of that has to be interrupted because the Sabbath takes precedence. And the obligation is to rejoice, not just to rest, but to rejoice on the Sabbath. And in fact, we're told it's a sin to be sad on the Sabbath. There's a longing, a longing for the Sabbath, a longing for God's presence in our lives, a longing for the sweetness of the day. My father said, the Sabbath, on the Sabbath, eternity utters a day. Eternity, the world to come, the paradise comes to us, a foretaste, an experience. The Sabbath, my father writes, the Sabbath comes like a caress, wiping away fear, sorrow, and somber memories. We pray, we sing, maybe we dance, we study. We relish the Sabbath. In fact, Judaism has no definition of paradise. It's never spelled out. We don't know exactly what to expect in paradise. But yet, we're told the Sabbath is a foretaste. What can we imagine? We're asked to imagine. When the soul of Moses comes to us on the Sabbath, it then returns to heaven at the end of the Sabbath, and God asks the soul, what new insights and wisdom of scripture have you learned on this Sabbath? The Sabbath is a day for insight, for learning, for study, for thinking about the Bible, for reading the Bible. Of course, the question we always ask is, how do we achieve holiness? How do we create holiness in our lives? How do we live as a holy people? What should we do? It's a challenge. How do we bring about that elusive and wonderful atmosphere that is the Sabbath? If the Sabbath is the presence of God open to our souls, as my father says, a foretaste, he says, and I agree, that we need the Sabbath if civilization is to survive. I think of the Sabbath as a foundation of humanity, of what keeps us human, of what we need to stay human, of what we need to remember that the way it is now with war, with violence, with corruption, with cruelty, that that's not what should be, that's not what we want, and that's not what will be. My father writes that inner liberty depends on being exempt from the domination of things, the domination of things, 
there is a spirit that we also need. My father points out that the existence of God is not something to be proven. The existence of God comes when we are witnesses to God's presence. And in fact, there's a famous commentary that says, I am God, and you are my witnesses. And if you are not my witnesses, then I am not God. How can God exist without witnesses? So we become witnesses of God's presence, and the Sabbath is that covenant that says, we are your witnesses. The holiday itself is a witness to God, a gift from God that we accept, that we revere. Life itself is a testimony to God, my father says. Let me just conclude with a few final comments from my father's work. You know, one of the things about my father's writing in all of his books is that there is a continuity from Abraham to the present. He doesn't say that there's a break in the modern period. He doesn't say we should only read scripture. He doesn't ignore any aspect of Judaism. It's all, all there, all there, richness and wonderful insights that we can draw from. Judaism isn't out there, as I sometimes hear people say, the tradition. No, it's part of our lives, just like the air we breathe. It infuses us. It's not something we relate to that is outside of us, but inside, that comes out of us. Just as we are witnesses to God, we are witnesses to Judaism or to whatever faith we have. Now, my father says that God needs our Sabbath observance. He says that when we human beings act, we affect God. God is affected by human beings. He takes this from the Bible. God is very passionate. God is very responsive to us. And my father says, if we are all the creation of God, then how I treat another person, yeah? That is going to affect God. It shows my respect for God when I respect a person. The Ten Commandments, my father says, the Ten Commandments say, you shall not make an image of God. And yet my father, with a great sense of humor, would say, when did God break the Ten Commandments? And then he would say, after all, it says in Genesis, God created human beings in God's image. <laughs> so he pointed out that we human beings are the only image, the only image of God, how we treat each other. You see? How we treat each other is how we're treating God. There is a participation of God in human life, he says, but then also a human participation in God's life, how God is affected by us. The Sabbath, he says, the Sabbath was created on the seventh day to sanctify, to marry us, to be a bride to human beings. The Sabbath is the mate of our loneliness. We're all lonely at times, and the Sabbath comes to our loneliness. Life, my father says, is a pilgrimage to the seventh day. We live our lives, we do our work, we study, we're busy, we build this world. But then comes the seventh day. And those six days, they're a pilgrimage, getting ready for that seventh day. 
You know, it says we mustn't covet al tachmod in the Bible, in the Ten Commandments. But we also speak of the Sabbath as chedas yamim, a day to be coveted. What does that mean? It's the day that God coveted, the day that God coveted, that God wanted us to have a Sabbath day. We don't covet things of space, but we covet things of time, my father says. And so, for my father, what was important was not how much we observe Jewish law, but how we observe the commandments. People used to telephone at our home, strangers, and they would ask to speak to my father, and they would say, I read your book on the Sabbath, and I, I, I've never observed the Sabbath, and I would like to start. What should I do? And he would just say, kindle the lights. He didn't prescribe. He didn't say, you, 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 mustn't, uh, you mustn't drive, or you mustn't do this or that, or you mustn't cook, or you have time. He didn't have prescriptions. He was more concerned with the heart, with the soul, with the atmosphere. How can you create? I want to, to just conclude with a word also about my growing up years. <laughs> On the Sabbath, it was a day of intensity. Friday was busy, but on the Sabbath, it was intense in the sense of being together. It was intense as a way of getting to know each other. I got to know my parents better on the Sabbath than any other day. They weren't busy, there were no distractions, the phone didn't ring, they weren't going out somewhere. We were together. And yes, Sometimes, often, we would talk about the past. I would ask my parents what it was like when they were growing up. But it was more than that. It was simply getting to know my parents' souls. On the Sabbath, I felt their souls. I felt their atmosphere. I felt their humor. I experienced their humor and their warmth, the teasing, the happiness, the jokes, the stories. But it was also the gentleness, the kindness, the warmth, the love. They are expressions of love for each other and for me. The Sabbath is a day of rest, a day of joy, a day of love. And I think truly that if only all of us could observe the Sabbath, we would have indeed not only a taste of the paradise, but perhaps a day of paradise on earth. I think it would make us a better world. I had a friend growing up, um, the da Rachel Davies, the daughter of W.D. Davies, who was a colleague of my father's and a, a great scholar of, uh, of the New Testament. And they kept the Sabbath. They were from Wales. And their Sabbath was on Sunday. And it was as serious and intense as the Sabbath in our home. And I felt, you know, the Sabbath has been given not only to Jews, but to Christians, too. The Sabbath is in the Bible. The Sabbath is for you. I know a little bit about the history. Sunday was the day of the resurrection, yes. And I know that early on, there were followers of Jesus who went to the synagogue and observed the Sabbath on Saturday and then went to church on Sunday. There are many ways in which Jesus is also associated with images of the Sabbath as the light of the world in the Gospel of John. Sunday was seen as the eighth day of creation, the day in which creation was fulfilled by the resurrection. Sunday was a day in the ancient church for morning and evening, public and private worship, and also for acts of mercy and kindness. In ancient days, just as with the Jewish Sabbath, fasting and kneeling were forbidden on Sunday because it was a day of celebrating the resurrection. Sunday became the holiday with the conversion of Constantine in 321. It was a holiday. But it was also a day that followed the Sabbath, and somehow that Saturday fell out. 
And I hope, actually, that it can come back. I hope that Christians can have both Sabbath and Sunday, because I see it as a gift from God for all of us. It's a tradition that has been important to Jews, deeply meaningful, and I think you should consider reviving the Sabbath in the Christian community as well and enjoying your day of paradise with us. Thank you. So I'll bring the microphone to you and you can ask a question. We have a little bit of time to, to do that. Thank you for your talk. Uh, for me, it was very enjoyable. I want to go to a piece that you just mentioned uh, about your father marching in 1965 in Selma. And growing up in the New York area during that period myself, uh, you know, I used to see uh, blacks and Jews together in demonstrations and whatnot or in marches of peace. I don't see that anymore, and I was wondering if you could reflect on that. Thank you. I hope everybody heard, yes? Uh, actually, I do see uh, blacks and Jews marching together. Uh, certainly in Ferguson, for example, over a long period of time, uh, there was a, uh, a rabbi there, a woman, a white woman, who came and was with everybody and brought in lots of Jews from her congregation. And there were Jews also from outside uh, the Ferguson area who came in, who flew in. Uh, I think there's actually quite a remarkable conversation that's going on these days, and people may not realize that maybe it's um, become more academic, but uh, you might know there's a recent book by Terence Johnson and Jacques Berliner Blau about blacks and Jews. Uh, there's a, my own work with Cornell West. I find uh, quite a few black theologians uh, who write about Jesus and Paul in ways that sound very similar to Jewish theologians, and I find that striking. I think there's a lot of attention paid to Jewish commentaries. I'm just thinking of Will Gaffney from Bright Divinity School, who actually lectured at Trinity two days ago, Trinity University, uh, and who pays a lot of attention to uh, Jewish sources, Jewish midrashic commentaries on the Bible in her own work. So I think there's a lot actually going on that may not always be as visible as it, as it could be. But thank you. Thank you again for being here. Um, State of Israel sent uh, a, three of us to uh, Israel in 2004. And uh, when we got off the airplane uh, in our two week uh, mission to explore and, and then report back on the radio our experiences in Israel. Our first night was Friday night, was actually Friday. And late in the afternoon, we were staying at the King David Hotel, walked up the hill to Hebrew toward Hebrew University, and there's a synagogue there. Hebrew Union College. Okay. Yes. Yes. And uh, just in time for Shabbat. And I was very moved by, and never forget, the joyous occasion as psalms were sung with the rabbi who was a gal uh, singing with a guitar, and, and all in Hebrew, and, there were, and the psalms became more alive because they were supposed to be sung. Uh, is that a common, that's Jerusalem, of course, how does that translate across the world, across, in the United States even? Ah, well actually, uh, that kind of, the service that you experienced in Jerusalem, you can find in the United States as well. And there's a lot of creativity that's been going on, I would say for about 30, 40 years. Uh, some of it is called the Jewish Renewal Movement, which is a movement that tries to uh, get us out of um, our you know, p position of sitting back and for some Jews go to the synagogue and they sit back and they let the rabbi do the praying for them vicariously, you know. Um, uh, that never happens here. <laughs> 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 
And so Jewish renewal is also part of an effort to, to make things a little more, as you just described, a little more lively, uh, uh, not so solemn, and not so somber. And uh, well, I, should I tell you this? Um, my father was very critical of American synagogues. Uh, you know, after World War II, there were big suburban synagogues built. Americans moved to the suburbs. He hated that. He said uh, that people, it's, it, people would sit back and uh, they weren't praying. He said the synagogue is where prayer goes to die. <laughs> yeah, he could be quite sharp. But you know what? I hate to say this. Sometimes it's true. I've been to such synagogues. And that's a pity. But I think that there has been an effort for many decades now to, to change that atmosphere. So thank you. Um, you described your growing up and your weekly practice of Sabbath, Friday to Saturday. But as an academic, have you gone on sabbatical? Have you taken two, three months off? And how would you dis um, uh, contrast that to your weekly practice? Ah, okay. Yes, I have had several sabbaticals, uh, um, thankfully. Um, and the question with, with an academic sabbatical is do you use your sabbatical to very intensely write that book? <laughs> or do you use your sabbatical to explore books and ideas that you don't have time to explore when you're busy with the teaching? And so use it as a time to perhaps reorient your interests. What do you do? What do I do? I write like mad. <laughs> um, I am thrilled to be able to meet you here. I, you, you may know there's um, a Reformed congregation, Kitty yes, Corner, from there. here, and yeah. I'm a member of that congregation. Okay. And I think one of the things that has revitalized the Jewish community so much is Jewish camp. Camp, yes. Um, especially the Reform movement and the conservative movement camps have kept our children Jewish. It's not the service. Uh, it is the Sabbath, and the kids know Sabbath from camp. I absolutely agree. The experience of a Jewish summer camp and how the Sabbath is observed and all the kids to take a shower and, <laughs> and put on a white outfit. We use, I assume, white dresses right, and then um, sing and pray together and have special food. It's, yeah, it's a great experience for, for kids to grow up with that. I completely agree. And I also think it shouldn't stop when you're 16 or 17. It should continue. And there should be camp for families, not just for the kids. Uh, I, I, yeah, it's hard to leave your kid at camp. Why not join? Or why not have... <laughs> Why not have a Sabbath camp where people in the community get together and go to some lovely spot, whether it's camping in tents or in a, in a, in a guest house, and, and have, make a Sabbath together as a community. It's lovely. I agree. Thanks. Dr. Heschel, thank you so very much for being here, and thank you to the Ellison uh, Scholarship Fund for bringing you here, and let's give her another round of applause. Thank you.